there and welcome to this 23rd video and teaching of 2021. My name is Dave Palmer and this is St. Thomas Aquinas for everyone. And I did a previous video about what I consider to be the most perplexing article or question in the Summa and it had to do with predestination and I want to revisit that here but I'm going to take a little bit of a different angle on it this time. And I want to introduce the fact that in the Summa Theologia, St. Thomas Aquinas clearly says that men are predestined, men are reprobated by God, and man has free will. And so there seems to be a contradiction, a tension there, and it's one of the parts of the Summa, one of the parts of Christian life that I find very fascinating. And so let's go on a journey together and see if we can reconcile these two free will and predestination, and why St. Thomas Aquinas would say that we have both. Okay, this video is going to be a little bit longer than others that I've done, so hang with me, and I think you'll learn this, and I want to hear your comments and your thoughts, because really the whole idea of this is to start a conversation so we can understand ourselves better, and also understand the great God that created us and whom we worship. Okay, I've said many times that I see the human life as a boomerang, where God throws us out like he would a boomerang, and then the idea being that we will come back to him like a good boomerang would, come right back to the one who threw it out. And so if all goes as planned, we will go back to God from whom we came. One of the um, analogies that Thomas uses often in the Summa Theologia is the archer shooting an arrow to a target. And he uses that to explain what's called teleology or the fact that God is directing all things to their end. Now, when he says all things to their end, that literally means all things. And that means that we are being directed to our end, as is the, the beaver and the butterfly and the fish and, you know, the, the rose bush or, or what have you. So that should make us think, well, if we're being directed to our end, what is the balance between God doing the directing and us responding in free will? How are we different from the fish and the dog and the cat and the aardvark? And that's the kind of thing that Thomas takes up many times in the Summa and which we are going to discuss in this video, okay? You remember I did a video on the five proofs for the existence of God and the one that I like the most, the one that I find most intriguing is the fifth proof and sometimes people call it the proof through intelligent intelligence or intelligent design i like to call it the governance of the world because it talks about as i'll explain here in a second the fact that there are things happening in the world that are being carried out by creatures that don't have intelligence like we do like the ducks like the spiders like the composting process but they're still being directed purposefully to an end. And Thomas says that we observe that in the world there are some things that lack intelligence, like you know, the non-rational creatures, like you know, you know, spiders and bugs and dogs and orangutans and you know that kind of thing. But they act for an end. Okay, they are designed this way, they are directed like that arrow to the target. And we have to come to the conclusion that there's some intelligence behind that. Okay, so let, let's just take that as a, mar as a starting point. Uh, in the fifth question of the Summa, Article 4, Thomas asks, does goodness have the aspect of a final cause? Now remember, one of the attributes of God is that he is good. Okay, he is goodness itself. And he says here, since goodness is that which all things desire, and since this has the aspect of an end, it is clear that goodness implies the aspect of an end. Nevertheless, the idea of goodness presupposes the idea of an efficient cause and also that of a formal cause. So right away, we have to say, okay, we all want good things, right? We all desire things. We desire pizza and hot fudge sundaes and friendship and romance and sleep and yeah, a, a, a thousand other things, a million other things, right? But what is it about all these things like the ones that I have on the screen here that we desire and what is the relationship between these and God and our final end? Okay, I think Thomas spends a lot of time considering this in the Summa and I would dare say it's really what the Summa is all about 
is our final end and how do we achieve it and what is that balance between free will and uh, providence or predestination, right? Thomas asks, now we're zipping all the way forward into Prima Secunda, the first of the second part of the Summa, question one, article six, does man will all whatsoever he wills for the last end? Okay, so when we play with our dog or our girlfriend or a boyfriend, when we eat a hamburger and we rest on the hammock, is it all being directed to a final end? Thomas says, yes, it is. Man must of necessity desire all whatsoever he desires for the last end. This is evident for two reasons. First, because whatever man desires, he desires it under the aspect of good. And if he desire it not as his perfect good, which is the last end, he must of necessity desire it as tending to the perfect good because the beginning of anything is always ordained to its completion. Okay, if you make a puzzle, that first puzzle piece you put in is always being mindful of the completion of the puzzle or building a house or uh, any other thing that you can think of, right? Uh, wherefore, every beginning of perfection is ordained to complete perfection, which is achieved through the last end. Secondly, because the last end stands in the same relation in moving the appetite as the first mover in other movement. Now it is clear that secondary moving causes do not move save inasmuch as they are moved by the first mover. Therefore, secondary objects of the appetite do not move the appetite except as ordained to the first object of the appetite, which is the last end. Okay, our, our, our creator, our first mover, our first cause, and our last end is the same thing. It's God. Our last end is God. Our first mover is God. Our first cause is God. The uncaused cause is God. So it's, okay, now he asks here, can providence be suitably attributed to God? It is necessary to attribute providence to God for all the good that is in created things has been created by God as was shown above. In created things, good is found not only as regards their substance, but also as regards their order towards an end and especially their last end. Okay, you see the theme here, <laughs> which in the divine goodness, which is in the divine goodness. This good of order existing in things created is itself created by God. Since, however, God is the cause of things by his intellect, and thus it behooves that the type of every effect should pre-exist in him, it is necessary that the type of the order of things toward their end should pre-exist in the divine mind and the type of things ordered towards an end is, properly speaking, providence. He's already starting to hint at predestination. Okay, It's all in the divine mind. God knows everything. He's outside of time. He knows what's going to happen. So again, where does this leave free will? Okay, Everything that happens in the world, the rotation of the planets around the sun or the photosynthesis process or the composting or the water cycle or any of these kind of things all right is everything subject to the providence of god there's a difference between universal and particular causes a thing can escape the order of a particular cause but not the order of a universal cause for nothing escapes the order of a particular cause except through the intervention and hindrance of some other particular cause since then all particular causes are included under the universal cause. It could not be that any effect should take place outside the range of that universal cause. So far then, as an effect escapes the order of the particular cause, it is said to be casual or fortuitous in respect of that cause. But if we regard the universal cause outside whose range no effect can happen, it is said to be foreseen. Okay, again, this is getting into predestination. It's really intriguing. It's really interesting. Yes, we have free will. There's universal causes. There's particular causes. There's contingencies. There's decisions we make. But in the end, God is in control. Okay, and here we are. Question uh, 19, Article 6, the first part of the Summa. Is God's will always fulfilled? He says, yes, God's will is always fulfilled. Okay. Uh, does it impose necessity on things willed? Uh, do we have to be ordered according to the will of God? The divine will imposes necessity on some things willed, but not on all. 
Since then, the divine will is perfectly efficacious. It follows not only that things are done, which God wills to be done, but also that they are done in the way that he wills. Now, God wills some things to be done necessarily, some contingently to the right ordering of things for the building up of the universe. Therefore, to some effects, he has attached necessary causes. All right, the sunrise, the sunset, gravity, beavers building dams. Okay, they don't have a choice. It's just going to happen, right? From which arise contingent effects. Um, okay, but to others, the def defectible and contingent causes from which arise contingent effects. Hence, it is not because the proximate causes are contingent that the effects will by God happen contingently, but because God prepared contingent causes for them, it, it being his will that they should happen contingently. Okay, so God's got it all figured out, but within that master plan of God, he is allowing contingencies. He's allowing us to make mistakes. He's allowing us to sin, but it's all going to be brought back into order by him in the mystery, okay? Now this brings up the issue of predestination, of course, which is known as associated particularly with Calvinist, John Calvin, the founder of the Calvinist religion and the Presbyterians of today lived in the 16th century when the Protestant Reformation was raging. Okay, so Thomas asks, question 23, article one, are men predestined by God? He said it is fitting that God should predestine men. For all things are subject to his providence. Now it belongs to providence to direct things to their end. The end towards which created things are directed by God is twofold. One which exceeds all proportion and faculty of created nature. And this end is life eternal. That consists in seeing God, which is above the nature of every creature. The other end, however, is proportionate to created nature. To which end created being can attain according to the power of its nature. Now, if a thing cannot attain to something by the power of its nature, it must be directed thereto by another. Thus, an arrow is directed by the archer towards a mark. Hence, properly speaking, a rational creature capable of eternal life is led towards it, directed as it were by God. Teleology, providence. Okay, the reason of that direction pre-exists in God, as in him is the type of the order of all things towards an end which we proved above to be providence. Now the type of the mind of the doer of something to be done is a kind of pre-existence in him of the thing to be done. Hence, the type of the aforesaid direction of a rational creature towards the end of life eternal is called predestination. For to desire is to direct or send. Thus it is clear that predestination as regards its object is a part of providence okay isn't that amazing is predestination certain yes he says predestination most certainly and infallibly takes effect yet it does not impose any necessity so that namely its effect should take place from necessity for it was said above that predestination is a part of providence but not all things subject to providence are necessary some things happen from contingency according to the nature of the proximate causes which divine providence has ordained for such effects, yet the order of providence is infallible. So also the order of predestination is certain, yet free will is not destroyed. Whence the effect of predestination has its contingency. Moreover, all that has been said about the divine knowledge and will must also be taken into consideration since they do not destroy contingency in things uh, although they themselves are most certain and infallible. Okay, do you see the tension here? I don't even know if it's if it's accurate to say it's tension. It really fits together beautifully, but you have to understand that um, God is in control, but he's worked out a plan that allows us to make mistakes, to sin, to error, to have contingencies, right? Does the, wire, does the will desire something in necessity? Um... This necessity of coercion is altogether repugnant to the will, for we call that violent, which is against the inclination of a thing. But the very movement of the will is an inclination to something. Therefore, as a thing is called natural because it is according to the inclination of nature, 
So is a thing called voluntary because it is according to the inclination of the will. Therefore, just as it is impossible for a thing to be at the same time violent and natural, so it is impossible for a thing to be absolutely coerced or violent and voluntary. In like manner, neither is natural necessity repugnant to the will. Indeed, more than this, for as the intellect of necessity adheres to the first principles, the will must of necessity adhere to the last end, which is happiness. Okay, so finally we get to the $64,000 question. Do we have free will? Man has free will. Otherwise, counsels, exhortations, commands, prohibitions, rewards, and punishments would be in vain. In order to make this evident, we must observe that some things act without judgment as a stone moves downward, and in like manner all things which lack knowledge. And some act from judgment, but not a free judgment as brute animals. But man acts from judgment because by his apprehensive power he judges that some things should be avoided or sought. But because this judgment, in the case of some particular act, is not from a natural instinct, but from some act of comparison in the reason, therefore he acts from free judgment and retains the power of being inclined to various things. Now, particular operations are contingent, and therefore, in such matters, the judgment of reason may follow opposite courses and is not determinant to one. Okay? Are you thoroughly confused, or are you saying, okay, that makes a little more sense? Yes, we have free will. Yes, there's predestination. Yes, there's providence. Yes, there's the governance of the world. Yes, the way we are directed to our end is very different from the way the fish or the dog or the cat or the butterfly is. But in God's master plan, he's allowed for contingencies. He's allowed for us to have free will, but that doesn't limit him. And that doesn't take away predestination because we're still predestined in some interesting and bizarre way, <laughs> right? I hope you enjoyed that comment and, uh, and let's, let's get a discussion going and let's continue to study the Summa here in 2021. God bless you.